Hello, and welcome to the Skype Sessions. Uh, today we have a returning guest to the show, Mr. Grayson Quay. Grayson, how's it going? Going great, thanks for having me back on. Well, same thing as last time. You have written some words and published them, and so we're going to talk about them. What are we talking about today? So we are talking about my most recent article in National Review, actually my first piece in National Review. It's called Against the Facebook Metaverse. And this refers to the new product coming out from the company formerly known as Facebook, but now called Meta. Uh, I'll put a link in the show notes to Mark Zuckerberg's video explaining what this is. But can you give us a, a condensed version of what it is that they're talking about doing? Well, I'd certainly recommend watching the video. It is, uh, it's an experience. But, uh, you know, you, it's, there's truly something amazing whenever Mark Zuckerberg tries to act. I, the, the one thing I kept thinking when I was watching it's like, stop moving your hands like this. <laughs> uh, you know, he, he could hire somebody else to do these, but he, he just, he's committed. He's got to do them himself. It um, reminds me of Steve, Steve Ballmer from uh, Microsoft. He always insisted on getting out on stage and dancing around in front of the developers, but some people you can't help. Anyway, yeah. what's he proposing? Sure. So he's proposing a new product that has uh, two... Um, components to it. Uh, one of them, virtual reality, got a lot of focus. So this is something like, uh, you know, virtual reality, something like The Matrix or Ready Player One or uh, William Gibson, uh, if you're a neuromancer, you know, if you're a little more old school with that. Um, <laughs> so, so in that, you put on some goggles, you can't see anything yeah. in the real world, and instead you're in an entirely virtual uh, yeah. existence. Yeah, you are entirely immersed. Um, you know, technically, I guess even a, a video game would be a, a form of virtual reality, though not as immersive, um, mm -hmm. where you're just kind of sitting there controlling something with a, an external interface. Um, the other aspect of it is augmented reality, or AR, so there's VR and AR. Augmented reality is something that you explore in the real world, and it kind of maps virtual elements onto actual meat space. Um, <laughs> So at, the, at, the, at the university that I went to, they were actually doing a lot of work in AR, and this was back in the very early 2000s. And I remember seeing it, and I was like, this is kind of cool, because you get to see things in the real world, but you have virtual things injected over the top. And I remember when we were presented with this, we were told of all the things that you could do with this. For example, if you were a mechanic, you could put on your AR goggles and look at an engine in real time with all of the added overlays to help you uh, diagnose any problems or tune the engine. Yeah, sure. You know, you could have, uh, you know, you could have all the parts of the engine labeled. You could be driving, and your route would, you know, the road you're supposed to be on would highlight blue, like literally. You wouldn't have to look at your phone. Um, you know, you could be walking down uh, Pennsylvania Avenue in D.C., and the statue of George Gordon Meade there will turn its head to you and tell you his his biography section from his Wikipedia page. Um, so, you know, so there are truly an infinite number of things you can do. So all this sounds wonderful. So why are you getting all tinfoil hat on us and uh, crying out that the sky is falling? What's wrong with this? Well, I mean, you know, it depends on what kind of answer you want. Uh, somebody might tell you it's just my nature, but... <laughs> my problem with it is that I think it's a symptom of kind of a larger disease. I think it's a symptom of the disenchantment of the world or... Um, to an extent, I think, what Lewis refers to in the discarded image as the process of internalization that we've been seeing uh, since ancient times. Uh, so there's my Lewis tie-in. <laughs> yeah. There you go. You got the discarded image right Yeah, there. and it's, it's a book that not a lot of people have read, and I'll be honest, I only read all of it. I read all the chapters on the planets, everything that I needed to know to read Dr. Michael Ward's book. But it's an introduction to medieval and Renaissance literature. Uh, and so... There is that Lewis quote that you just you just gave now. Can you just unpack what that means? Sure, I've got it. Uh, I've got a chunk of it in my article. He says there's a great movement of internalization and that consequent aggrandizement of man and the desiccation of the outer universe uh, that is the feature of modernity. So basically, it's this idea that um, the world used to be populated by all these kind of external influences. You used to have uh, the stars had influences. Um, you know, influenza, the flu is literally just means influence. It was thought to be caused by kind of bad star influences. Um, you had angels, you had demons, you had sprites. Um, 
everything sort of fit together and acted on everything else, and, um, you know, Earth was sort of the point at the center that was, you know, kind of mathematically insignificant, right? Now, we've kind of reduced the external universe to, it's all one thing, it's all one mechanism, it's all molecules in motion uh, that we can study according to known scientific laws, uh, it's nothing more than that, and all of the, the stuff that was outside in this big teeming universe uh, is now in our heads, uh, thanks to Freud and company. And thanks to the possible metaverse, things will really be in our heads. Yeah, so I think what's happening with the metaverse is we've kind of stripped the external world down to bare bones. Um, I also kind of, in my article, I allude to the abolition of man, where he talks about, like, are there objective qualities that things have in the world, or are we just projecting our feelings onto it, right? Again, is it out there, or is it in our heads? And he said the modern kind of view is that it's all in our heads. Um, you know, there's, you can't say anything about the duty of a father, you can only say something about how a newborn crying makes you feel. You can't say anything about the sublimity of the waterfall, all you can say is how looking at it makes you feel, right? So, if the world is truly that empty, um, we need to fill it back up, and that's where the metaverse it, comes it's, in. It's like uh, we're rewinding back to Genesis 1, uh, and the, the, the world is still formless and void. It's got a little bit of form, but we now need to fill it up with some yeah. new things. Exactly. Yeah, we can make our own burning bushes. Uh, now, one of the things, though, that you talk about in your article is about the joy that you had uh, playing Pokemon Go, because it is kind of an uh, augmented reality game where you travel around the real world, but on your phone you can see if there if there are digital Pokemon hiding around the corners, and you it was funny. I never really got into the whole Pokemon Go thing. I just sort of sat back and pretended that I was above it and was secretly just kind of wished that I, I could just go and, you know, catch a Pikachu myself. But uh, when I was reading that section when you were talking about how how much fun you had, I, I it, it put me in mind of the stuff that Chesterton says about, you know, enchanting the world. It's the very topic that you're, that you're looking at. Um but also Lewis, when in Surprise by Joy, he talks about reading George MacDonald's book, Fantasties. And there he says that after he'd read it, the bright shadow sort of came out of the book into the real world and rested there, transforming all common things, uh, and yet itself was unchanged. Or more accurately, I saw the common things drawn into the bright shadow. So there does definitely seem to be the capacity here uh, for tools like this to actually help us re-enchant the world when we've become rather blasé, even if it's as simple as uh, you're looking for, um, uh, if you're looking for a, a Pokemon in a neighborhood that you've never been to before, so you get to experience more of the real world um, while participating in this digital world. Yeah, and that was certainly a good thing that I saw about it. I mean, anything that gets people to kind of engage with the, the real world around them more, I think is, is a positive good in a lot of ways. Um, you know, Lewis loved going on walking tours, right? And the kind of built environment we have isn't like that anymore. He also really laments kind of the, the creation of the automobile. He himself never learns to drive. And he talks about how, you know, as a boy seeing these mountains in the distance, they were, you know, these beautiful, romantic, faraway places. And now it's like, oh, we can drive there in 30 minutes. So it kind of constricts his world and makes it less wonderful. Um, where my problem comes in is I think that augmented reality, while it can encourage you to kind of explore the meat space around you a little more, ultimately the higher reality, the layer of enchantment or the, um, the bright shadow that you're encountering is not anything objective, is not anything real, is not anything placed there by God. The God of this universe, the, the God of this enchanted realm is Mark Zuckerberg. Which is a terrifying thought. <laughs> But yeah, the, the, the heavens declare the glory of God. Uh, Romans, it talks about all of God's attributes being, being clear to us. The, the purpose of the world is to be sacramental in the sense that it's meant to point us beyond itself, saying, don't look here, look beyond. And there does seem to be a bit of a problem when you start putting other things on top of it, because you're basically changing what the world you're experiencing is actually saying. And this ties in with the abolition of man, 
because who gets to decide what this new metaverse is actually saying? Yeah. Yeah, to kind of revisit the point from earlier, I think there's something good about going on a quest regardless. You know, you have Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Um, you know, those people getting together and explain and telling stories to each other is something good and beautiful and valuable in itself. But I do think it makes a difference whether they're going to Canterbury to encounter the relics of Thomas Beckett or whether they're going to Canterbury to try to catch a mew, you know? Well, was, but that is a really good Pokemon, though. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, well, I go. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it does come back to Abolition of Man, and Lewis in Abolition of Man uh, talks about these this class of controllers um, mm -hmm. who are allowed to or empowered to basically uh, create values and to engineer values into people through education and conditioning and various other technocratic means, and that ultimately those people lose their humanity um, because they aren't allowed to allow themselves any kind of standard by which to work. It just becomes their whims, and then the people that they're experimenting on certainly lose their humanity. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's something we're going to see with the metaverse too. Um, well, you I know, think... in the video, you, in the watch video, yeah, you see, um, you see him talking about kind of user-created content that, you know, anyone can kind of create art and place it within the metaverse, but ultimately the one making the rules there and deciding what can be there and what it can't is Mark Zuckerberg. Exactly. And I was just going to say, we already see something of this on social media today. They basically get to decide what you see, and they also get to decide what you post. And if they don't like what you post, they don't have to explain to you anything. They just say, no, it goes against our standards, which are usually as vague as possible. So you have absolutely no way of testing this. Um, so it's already starting to shape reality. Uh, but when you, if, if you are stepping into a virtual world where it's entirely controlled, um, you can effectively be shut off. At the moment, we're reading The Four Loves, and one of the things that Lewis says that's dangerous about friend groups is that you become deaf to the outside world. Well, this is the way to become perpetually deaf, deaf to the outside world. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the CEO of Niantic, which is the company behind Pokemon Go, um, kind of released its own pitch for its vision of AR. And it talks about this idea of having channels that you could switch between that would place different layers over the world. Um, so he says, oh, you know, maybe you'll go to the, um, you know, maybe you'll go to the park and you'll see somebody with the Marvel Augmented Universe filter on and they're, you know, standing around punching the air and they think they're fighting Thanos or something. And maybe you'll see... Um, people with the Indiana Jones filter on and they're running from an invisible boulder uh, or puzzling out an inscription on the sidewalk that only they can see. And I'm reading this and I'm like, Are you, did you read this before you posted this? This sounds like a psych ward. <laughs> but the first thought I... You know, you walk in and everyone's just in their own encapsulated world kind of doing their own thing. It's like Chesterton talks about with like the perfect circle of mm -hmm, madness. Exactly. Right, that's completely, completely consistent and completely unbreakable. And at the same time, the, the vision that he's describing there, it actually makes LARPers, live action role players, seem cool. I mean, at least they're putting in some effort. They're wearing a costume and meeting other real people. Yeah, you've got to use your imagination. <laughs> <laughs> so what's really the bottom line on this? I mean, I, I definitely see the concerns, but this does kind of seem like a juggernaut that nobody is really going to be able to stop. How is it actually possible to... Uh, consume this in a way that you think is uh, is reasonable? It's like, I know so many people who have quit social media. This, this, they've reached a certain point at which they've said, I want to be happier in my life. I need more reality in my life rather than getting into arguments with people on the other side of the world who I've never met. And so then they, they cut themselves off. And I've, I've yet to hear anybody say that they got rid of social media and their life is is, is emptier for it. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, it's tough for me. I mean, with the, you know, being a being a journalist, so much of the so much of the discourse and so much of the connection takes place over Twitter, and it's agonizing to me. But it it feels like the bills have to be right now. You know, I maybe maybe someday I can get to a place in my life where I can just log mm -hmm. off and touch grass forever. But um, yeah, I do think though that it's it's a good idea to start thinking really critically about this 
and say, okay, where am I going to draw the line in the sand? Um, and maybe maybe we should have drawn the line further back. Maybe it was a bad idea to ever have a smartphone. I, th I think it probably was. But Well, even there, that I've seen a real movement among people uh, who are really going down to dumb phones. And there are actually now special products that will come out that will pretty much turn your iPhone into a fairly simple brick. There are these fairly few things you can do. And there are even people bringing out uh, something in between. So they're like monochrome. They do, they're very basic, but they're an entirely separate device. So you don't waste all of your time scrolling through feeds. Yeah, I think I've seen a device called Wise Phone or something where it essentially mm -hmm. has calling, texting, and navigation. Um, yeah. Even that's a massive loss. You know, people used to be able to navigate without, without a navigation app. I can't get anywhere. This this is true. I mean, I, although I, I I agree with that in principle, but I, I I do worry what would happen if I set out in the car with say just a map. Uh, oh yeah. I'm I not sure that. if I'd get home before dark. Yeah, no, I have a terrible uh, I have a terrible sense of direction. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's I think it's a good question to ask yourself. Like, you know, do I ever want to have any kind of augmented reality device? And where I'm at is I'm leaning towards no. I could see myself using augmented reality devices um, in very limited contexts. You know, if there was a, a game or something that you could play within a kind of particular venue with friends where it has a, stop, a start and stop point, you know, where it takes mm -hmm. 20 minutes to play a round of this game and then you're done and then you shut it off and you walk away. But, you know, something that's on the level of Pokemon Go where it is something that you sort of are passively playing all the time uh, with an added degree of immersion, I just, yeah, I see a lot of danger there. I think that, I think that it's just really disconnecting us from reality. And if we take seriously that, um, reality, which I talk about in the article exists kind of at the intersection of the objective physical world, which is, you know, from an objective physical point of view is just atoms and molecules in motion. You know, there's no such thing as a chair. There's some molecules in a particular structure and we call it a chair, right? Um, mm -hmm. And our perceptions, which we, our brains are wired by, you know, millions and millions of years of evolution to, per to perceive objects and to perceive um, narratives and to view the world in a, uh, an instrumental and utilitarian way. And I think if you're a Christian, at least, you, you believe really strongly that that point of intersection is in some sense divinely ordained. Lewis talks about that in uh, Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer. Yeah. He says he kind of does this exercise when he prays where he tries to remind himself that the, um, that, you know, sp uh, space isn't real, time isn't real, matter is in quantum flux all the time. So when he's sitting, you know, when he's kneeling by his bed in his room, he tries to kind of have the, like imaginatively have the walls of the room melt away and everything go away because he's, it's sort of his way of, humbly emptying himself out and um, you know he has this idea of, iconic, of iconoclastic reality right that, that reality is always breaking our idols God's always breaking our idols um, you know I want God not my idea of God I want the world not my idea of the world and that's what he's trying to do is let go of his idea of the world and somehow encounter reality in a real way but he says that's only really good as a prayer exercise. Like if you go down that path in your real world, in your real life, you go mad because you have to accept that God made the world a certain way, made us perceive the world a certain way, and that the place where those two things intersect matters because, you know, uh, Jesus Christ took on our, our human senses and perceived the world in that mm. way. Yeah. You know, when he said, hand me a denarius, like that was a thing, you know, he, engaged with it in categories of space and time and language the same way we engage with things and yet at the same time interacted in a way that transcended it on the cross it wasn't just simply a criminal being killed uh but the weight of the sins being put upon the son of god um such that we can be saved there's, there's that interaction and in your article you also talk about the experience of with, when you go to church uh, you give the example of North Rocks Church, the Divine Liturgy. There are all of these things that are that are pointing beyond themselves. Yeah, and you go to a Byzantine right church, don't you? I used Some to. Church. We we now live in Wisconsin, and there isn't one near. But we we, okay. we go about once a quarter now. All right. Yeah. Well, I I visited an Orthodox church in in D 
D.C. where I live near, and yeah, it was just this incredible experience for me of, you know, seeing the icons and um, just kind of learning about their theology and their view of, of um, their view of sainthood and just all this other stuff, and I was like, wow, this is augmented reality, you know, the, <laughs> you know, you have these icons and you know, as an Orthodox, you would believe those saints are all really there. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the line, that you, the way you put it, I really liked it. Kissing the wood and paint is like pressing your lips to your lovers with a thin curtain in between. Uh, Orthodox often talk about icons as being windows to heaven. Uh, and it's just this idea that you are in a very, I think Lewis would call it a thin place, that, that you are very close to something that's beyond this world. And even when the priest processes in with the bread and the wine, uh, the, the people sing about the fact that we are now surrounded by these angels and while they might not be visible to our senses we are and so we will participate in this heavenly uh realities heavenly worship of god um i i really liked the, the idea that this is sort of augmented reality we should be getting back to yeah and i think that's the way um i think that's the way to push back against the the metaverse um I forget who said it, but there's a line that says, uh, in the, you know, in the era that's coming, a Christian will have to be a mystic or nothing. Um, and I think, you know, whatever your tradition is, you know, try to cultivate some, some of that mysticism, some of that wonder, some of that idea that, that the world is, is more than the kind of physical objects you're interacting with. But not simply the creation of a software engineer. So that goes terribly badly. Uh, at the time that we're recording this, I, I, I saw something in the news about some policeman who didn't respond to a robbery because they were busy playing Pokemon Go. And when it first came out, I remember there being lots of stories about people dying because they were trying to uh, chase a, a turtle thing uh, off a cliff that it was there and they weren't looking where they were going. They were paying more attention to the virtual world than the real one. Squirtle, that was it, Squirtle. <laughs> Yeah, it's strange. Those those figures, I guess you could almost yeah, you could almost call them, I guess, like the 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 desert fathers of the metaverse, right? They're these people who are just recklessly uh, the the holy fools of the metaverse. <laughs> but it, it's interesting that you mentioned the the desert fathers because that when we're talking about uh, discerning how we would interact with this, there might be a a place for people to be like the desert fathers in terms of uh, eschewing regular society, or in this case, virtual society. And instead going off by themselves, uh, not so much into the desert, but, you know, into real reality rather than virtual or augmented. I thought for a while that we need a new stylite. If anyone wants to become a stylite, you know, DM me and I'll, I'll certainly contribute. I have actually that heard that there, there was one. Where was it? It was somewhere, I think it was somewhere in Greece, probably, probably. Uh, they, uh, they said that, oh no, they had a stylite. It was the question of the government weren't letting, the, weren't letting him live on top of a pillar. Um, <laughs> But no, I'm I'm down for it. But not for the Starlight thing. I have stuff to do. Oh yeah, no, I can't. I can't. Um, <laughs> cool. Well, any yeah, I can just see that conversation, sweetheart. I want to go. Uh... <laughs> I want to go live in, live in a pillow. I want to go live on top of a pillow for a couple years. Well, do you have any concluding thoughts as we as we wrap up? Uh, none that I can really think of. Uh, just you know, kind of revisiting the idea I had of you know, to cultivate some, cultivate some mysticism, remind yourself constantly that the world isn't just molecules in motion. Um, and that you don't have to live in Mark Zuckerberg's world. You can live in God's world and it's better. I think that's a good way to sign off. Wonderful. Grayson, thank you for coming on the show. Right. Well, thanks for having me. And please join us next time when we'll go further up and further in. Cheers. <laughs>